Hello, everyone. All right, so movement. Movement and how it ties in to everyday life, all right? I'll just start from the very, very, very beginning. Once upon a time in sixth grade, I had to skip school. And in skipping school, I watched a movie called Breaking. Watched a movie called Breaking, I saw a guy named Turbo on the VHS tape. I mimicked what Turbo did twice. My brother walked in, he was skipping school also. He asked me what I was doing, I showed him what I was doing. He said, oh, I didn't know you can do that. I said, what am I doing? Turbo happened to be like the godfather of popping, but I was good at mimicking him. So, very next day at school, I walk down the street because usually circles mean, you know, someone's fighting after school. Where I'm from in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, that happened every single day. There was a fight every day, and I was in a good amount of them a lot of the time. So, by doing that, I walk into a circle because I'm like, oh, who's fighting in here? And I see white gloves in the circle, and I see a bandana, and I see a sweatsuit, and I see two guys wearing uh, army fatigues, and they're facing the other two, and then someone starts playing music, and I just see the two guys moving. Boom, boom. It's like, they're not fighting. They're dancing. So I get a, a push in my back, and I fall into the circle. It's like, who's that? And I hear, my brother can do that too. Like, come on. So of course, I do it. What I've kind of started to mimic. And I fell into it. I fell into that entire realm of movement. Those same guys that I got pushed into, I've known them since the sixth grade. We've been dancing since the sixth grade. Some of those guys I work with right now on a professional level on a tour called Love Heals All Wounds with MAI. And that's targeting uh, the isms, it's tar targeting global warming, it's targeting all types of things through movement. And it's a very beautiful show, shoot Netflix starting in November. We're going to start shooting an actual movie for that. Uh, and, oh, thank you, thank you. But that's all like my, one of my really good friends, my brother, John Boogs and Little Buck, like you'll, you'll figure who they are in a, in a little bit. It'll, they're very phenomenal dancers. But just to get back on it, dancing kept me from running through the streets in the middle of the night. Dancing kept me from selling drugs, doing drugs, shooting someone for drugs or because of being on drugs. A lot of my friends went through that phase. A lot of them went through that phase. Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 80s, 90s, not a good place to be. So dancing, I can say from there, saved my life. Let's skip forward a little bit. Football, track, baseball, uh, anything, basketball. Played it, had a great look when it came down to scholarship, just getting out there to play some ball. 17 years old, enlisted to the United States Marine Corps. Walked in the recruiter's office one day, Monday. The Marine Corps can do this, 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 and this. I don't give a damn. When's the next flight going? That was my mentality. When's the next flight? I didn't know what the Marine Corps was. I knew the Army, I knew the Air Force, I knew Delta and all these other crazy names, but I didn't know what the Marine Corps was. It was me wanting to get away from everything. So on Monday I went in, Friday I flew out. Two of my siblings knew, one of my friends knew. I was gone. I turned 18 in boot camp, 19 in Afghanistan, uh, uh, Fallujah, Iraq. Did the Marine Corps for a long time, did private contracting for a long time. Got out, came back to real world. Two kids, beautiful, Maya and QJ, Quentin Jr. Crazy. She's massive now. She's extremely tall. She's 10. She wears a size 10 shoe. <laughs> uh, and that's a real thing. She's wearing a size 10 shoe. She's massive. I don't know how tall she's going to be. But that's, that's, the, that's the, the normal version 
of that story. That's the story that you tell people. That's the story that I just told you. In between everything, there's being called nigger. There's being, there's doors being shut in your face. There's going to the doctor's office with your kid's mom and being looked at because again, you're young. There's being told what you can't, won't, and will never ever be able to do by others and family members because they come from a certain era where that's the standard. And when the standard is shaking just a little bit, something's wrong with you. Don't do it. We said, don't rock the boat. Do not do it. So let's skip forward a little bit more until, let's say, two days ago. I'm on a plane, 5 a.m., early, excited, coming to Biff, coming to see Saul. Ah, I'm going in, you know? Walking down the aisle of the plane, back, bag in the front, bag in the back. I look up to see my aisle, my, my row, and my bag catches the meanest elbow. Hot coffee in my hand. The bag swings, the coffee almost spills. I throw my hand on top of it to keep it from pouring out on the lady that was in the aisle that I was flung into. So hot coffee is literally going down my hand. I, I just got this coffee. It's pouring into my hand. My bag finally like catches up, the one in the front catches up and hits the lady. I turn around and there's a man sitting there and he has his book with his glasses halfway down and he's just turning away from what he just did and his wife is like, I look at the lady behind me, she looks as if nothing happened. I am a product of my environment. And what I mean by that is everything that happened to me growing up, I am a product of that. I don't live it. I don't, being a product of your environment doesn't mean you do the exact same thing. I learned how to deal. I've learned how to combat. I've learned how to do certain things certain ways because of where I'm from. But in that particular moment, that shit went out of the window immediately. <laughs> I leaned into him because I didn't want, and, and I'll explain to you. I leaned into him, and this is not my best moment in time, but I want to be honest with you all. I leaned into him and I said, if I slap you in your mouth right now, you're going to play the victim in front of all of these people. You just did that purposefully with ill will. If I break you right now, I'm going to get in trouble. No one's going to see or pay attention to what you just did. They're going to go off of my reaction. And then a thousand other things went through my head at the same exact time. Should I take his glasses and throw them or stomp on them? Should I take his book and rip that one page out and ball it up and toss it? What should I do to him because I am angry right now? Should I wait for him to get off the plane and body slam him? Like, what are we going to do? Something has to happen because it's a win-win for him. Ignorance always has a win-win. When you're trying to do something positive, you have a lose-lose 90% of the time when you're on that journey. So that lose-lose is, okay, he just did something extremely disrespectful to me. If I react, he wins because he's going to throw his hands up and play surprised. And then I'm banned from Delta. I'm on the news. I'm not coming to Biff. I can't wear this suit right here. Like everything is just messed up in a heartbeat. But then I go and sit down. He wins again because he just put hands on me He's sitting there all, and by the way, when I spoke to him, he immediately came deaf and blind. Like he was, he wasn't moving. But I sit down, now he tells all his friends what he did and how he did it and how this guy, all of these things are in my head like, like Charlie Murphy and Rick James, like, no, go stomp this man out right here. Like, <laughs> no, he just like slapped you real hard, right? 
but I didn't. Because again, movement. It circles back to movement. I've been dancing all of my life. Through everything I've gone through, all the way up until a few days ago, I've been dancing. I've been interacting with people. I've been act- interacting with kids. I've had things happen to me in Missoula. Some of you follow those things that happen to me through town. But guess what? Missoula, there's about negative three African Americans that live there. <laughs> so by being there, it taught me a lot. It taught me a lot. It's not to try to change the minds of everyone because you can't. The youth, that's important. I'm in schools with 99% white kids. And there's a reason, there's a method to it because they have never interacted with the black man a day in their life. And they probably never will if I don't walk into that school and do what I do the way I do it. So doing the work to, to, to impact them I look at it as like a positive, positive Freddy Krueger. It's like when your kids go out into dreamland, I'm going to be there. They're not going to die, but I'm going to be there. We're going to dance. They're going to get a different perspective. All of these things are going to happen. So when they go home and they hear you talking on the news, oh, look at this blah, blah, blah. That kid automatically is going to know something's wrong because their interaction versus what they're told It's completely different. And that's why the traveling, the work, being in the locations, going through the systems and actually talking, moving. There's nothing better than getting in a room and catching an aha moment with a kiddo. Right? There's nothing like it. An aha moment is the best thing. Aha! I can do that move. Aha! Barack Obama's not the only black man in the world. (laughs) Aha, we are, they're, they're brilliant, they're strong. All of these things just pour in. So with that, all of that combined in those issues and those situations, I am a product of my environment and my experiences. I started Movements for Movements. It's a nonprofit organization and we target mental, physical trauma, disassociation. We go into Camp Make a Dream. My mother, she passed away from breast cancer. Everything that impacted me throughout my life, I just wanna bottle that up and do work towards it. So to go to the disenfranchised neighborhoods, to go to Camp Make a Dream, to go to all of these locations where people are in need or wanting, and raising money and doing these types of things to get the information to them or get the experience to them. That's where I'm diving into. So I have this entire slide set up. That's Africa. I'm just going to go really quick. That's Africa. We went to Naka Valley Refugee Settlement and did a workshop with 120,000 refugees on that camp. It was amazing. We have footage of that also, and you can find it on the website and everything. This is the Love Hills All Wounds group. That's at UCLA. We had people like Natalie Portman, Jordan Peele, all of these people in the front row watching this work and wanting to support. That's Soft Landings in Missoula. That's an uh, organization that, replace, that uh, places refugees, uh, resettles refugees in the city. This is where and how I bottle everything up. I bottle everything up by doing this. Because if I just go out and I say racism is an issue, we know. What system are you talking about? What avenue are you talking about? What are you speaking about? Like, what do you want to change? Everything. It doesn't work like that. So this is what I go through before stepping out and going into that I would say a war zone or place of need. My students, they will tell you this in a heartbeat. This is what I tell them every time we do a performance, we rehearse or anything. If you put your intentions into it and you put everything you have and I see you working, I see you trying, everything that's happening, we could be at a show and you can be flying off of the stage like 
in a full pirouette and we'll be over here taking a knee. If that's the wrong move, but you did it like meaningfully and that's what you honestly thought, I'm going to clap for you after. You're not getting in trouble by me. You meant to do that. That was purposeful. I've seen you work hard. Go for it. That's what it feels like a lot of the times, even on stage, even in performances. When we're doing certain things, when I'm going around and and trying to spread certain messages, it feels like that. It feels like that. And that's okay. Because as individuals, as people, as entrepreneurs, the hardest thing to do is listen to yourself or be with yourself and be okay with that. And also as a dancer, we make up things on a spot, which means I have to stick to a certain set of rules that often change a lot. This is where I draw inspiration from. That's my little girl running We told her we were going fishing. She sprinted across that entire beach. That's a big ocean, one fishing pole, one tiny little human, but she just knew she was going to catch something. (laughs) Like she was ready. She did. She caught a lot. And I was proud of it. I didn't catch anything. She caught a lot. 